All right, in this part of uh, the course, let's talk about some of the limits of large language model code generation. And of course, the question that's on everybody's job, <laughs> their Freudian slip mind, is are the large language models, with all of this code generation, are they coming for, for our jobs, basically? And the future, I mean, who knows within five, 10 years? Certainly, as this pushes towards what you call the singularity, which is the convergence where it meets and then exceeds human intelligence, certainly we're going to have to figure, figure out some things at that point. But at this point, definitely not. Uh, I think this is going to push us to kind of a never higher level of abstraction where certainly a lot of the just grunt work code and code that often has been written a thousand times before you like different database connectivities, all this plumbing sort of thing. Those kind of things, I do think we're going to start having the large language models. So for, for now, for the foreseeable future, and not too much is that foreseeable, I would have never guessed that we were at this point to pushing the edge, maybe even exceeding the Turing test, where you can have this fluid of a conversation with, with a machine. I had no idea two, year, two years before we had ChatGPT that, that we were that close to this. So let's look at some of the limitations of these, these large language models. I have a number of them sort of um, written here. So analysis of large amounts of data. So basically, the large language models you're really describing what the data looks like or you're giving them some sample of the data. It's not that iterative of a process. And that's what I'm talking about with, with the third one. So like a Kaggle competition. We are definitely not to the point where the machines have locked down the Kaggle competition that human knowledge has nothing really to, to do with that anymore. We used to say the same things of chess and Go. So certainly that's coming. But at this point, the machines can't really sit there and crunch and analyze on large amounts of data. They need a description of what that data is, and then they operate off the description. And if their first model, their first pass at it, isn't the highest of, of accurate, that's, that's actually where AutoML, which is very different than LLMs, can be, uh, can be quite, quite useful. Operating at the boundary of human understanding. So most corporate work, let's be real, you are probably writing code that in some way, shape, or form has been written a thousand times before you ever wrote it. Such is the reality. So if you look across, I mean, if you think about what, what modern software development is, often you go to Stack Overflow, you find something that's pretty close and you, you kind of custom fit it. That's what the AI can do now really, really well. If your main contribution to a software engineering team is that you can go take code off of Stack Overflow, modify it a little bit, and throw it into production, that's awesome. That was really awesome three years ago, but that's the kind of thing that the, that the large language models can do quite well. If you're doing something that is so new, so novel, that just going even and looking at Stack Overflow and finding code to, to put in, it's just not going to be there. That's the kind of thing the large language models can't do. I mean, think about it. At OpenAI, on the ChatGPT team, do you really think ChatGPT is one of the developers on that team? They cannot push human understanding just yet. There's not been a scientific paper written completely by LLMs where they've made some scientific discovery. Those are some of the milestones that I'm certainly looking for as, as we push to, to the singularity, to convergence. But we're definitely not, not there yet at, at this point. Dealing with breaking changes in new libraries. So I do a lot of work with PyQt 5, 5 and 6, and the large language models really know PyQt 5, and they will always give me code. This is for user interfaces. And they will always give me code that is not, that is not 
right for Pi Qt6. They'll give me Pi Qt5. And I have to even say, look, you, you did this wrong. And they will, they will adjust it. But with all the breaking changes in software libraries and programming languages themselves, they just have a lot of difficulty when you're kind of straddling that edge because they have not had their foundational models updated yet with those new things. Again, also coping with uh, new programming language features. Certainly, these programming languages add lots and lots of new features. Most of this is what you would call syntax sugar that we are able to basically just, just to make things easier for humans. I think you're going to start to see things in programming languages to make things easier for AI in the future as well. Because if you think about it, what is the optimal programming language for AI? Uh, right now, it does a lot of Python, but who, who knows? Maybe you skip that level of the interpreter or the compiler that used to be between, there, or that is between us and the low-level assembly code. At some point, maybe you just have the, the large language models write primarily in assembly and not deal with that in-between layer. Large proprietary function libraries. I think this is what will keep jobs in this space safe for the longest, is in your typical corporate environment, you have these monolithic libraries of stuff that accesses all of the various systems. And they're, they're just big, big programs. And the, the large language models are simply not going to be familiar with all of the code that goes off and finds the rate table for a particular whole life policy that your program is now recalculating the premium values due to a policyholder change. I just rattled off something that's very specific to the industry I work in, which is insurance. But all industries have this, this kind of thing, and the company products are very different. The large language model would know what a whole life policy is, or it would know what premiums are, but it would not know specifically how a company such as the one that I work for would be doing that, because these policies and the structure of them is at the very core of the competitive advantage that one insurance company will have on another. And I kind of led into that as well, but modifi modifying large monolithic software projects. You really need to structure these, and the unit tests, the SDLC folks have been preaching this for years, but you really need a bunch of small modules that you're going to make use of um, and that have well-defined contracts between them so that the large language model can modify one little island of that, one object, and not cause the whole thing to come crumbling down. So these are some of the key things that I think of in terms of limits of the large language models. Some of these, these are the ones that I view as more just not like gotchas, but kind of core things that, that certainly are, are difficult to deal with. I think a lot of these will be solved by building the code generation more and more into things like the, the GitHub repository so that it could potentially load your company's entire code base into, say, a RAG database and be able to, to access it quite quickly for the LLM. Well, anyway, any other limitations that you've seen, definitely let me know in the comments. Uh, the, the ongoing discussion is often the most fun part of this. So thank you for watching the video and definitely subscribe so that you see everything else that comes out for this class. And if this was helpful, please give me a like. Thank you very much.